me find the right window to share. Here we go. Okay. All right, um, I assume you can all see my screen um, and I will start my talk. Um, first of all, thank you for inviting me. It's a pleasure to give this talk to an audience that, um, you know, I, I have not had much experience with. And so I hope this uh, talk is useful to you and um, um, I will be happy to answer questions um, later in the, at the end of the talk or um, with follow-up emails um, as, as you see fit. Um, so today I will talk about the Astrophysics Data System or ADS as it's, as it's known in the astronomy community. And I will try to highlight, um, I understand that many of you know, already know ADS. So I, I thought I'd try to make this talk interesting, especially highlighting new features, lesser known features, and explaining uh, what's in our uh, near future. Okay, so let me, okay, so as a brief summary, let me just summarize uh, what, is the NASA Astrophysics Data System. First of all, um, as it's implied in its name, it is a project that is funded by NASA. Um, and the purpose of the ADS is to provide discovery services focused on the scholarly literature in astronomy and related areas of physics. Um, although we have a lot of astronomy records, the majority of the records um, are actually parts of other parts of physics. So right now we have um, about 60 million total records um, from all areas of astronomy and physics. And most of these records correspond to traditional publications, what you would expect um, scholarly articles. Um, out of the 16 million, uh, we have a subset, 6 million, for which we have the full text documents um, archived in ADS and indexed by the system. And I will show you why that is important to us. Um, out of these publications, we keep uh, track of citations. And that leads us to create what we call the citation graph, that is connections between papers based on the fact, um, based on whether a particular paper cites another paper. So we have over 145 million connections between papers based on citation events. And we also connect and uh, collect anonymous usage data, which is um, only used for the purpose of providing recommendations. And I will talk a little more about that. So ADS is part of a large ecosystem of data archives. On the right of this picture, you will see um, all the archives, the main astrophysics archives that um, NASA funds, as well as the planetary data system, uh, which has its own set of nodes. So you may recognize um, the, the NASA Extra Galactic Database, NED, URSA has infrared, um, is an infrared archive maintained at Caltech. There's Nexi that maintains exoplanet data. MAST has space telescope. Um, is hosted a space telescope and has Hubble Space Telescope and soon JWST data. Then there is ADS and HESARC is the high energy archive um, for NASA content. On the left, as you uh, probably uh, recognize, there are a lot of other projects, international product projects, um, all of which participate in the International Virtual Observatory Alliance. So this is just to give a sense of the fact that ADS is somewhat unique in this ecosystem because we are the only archive that maintains scholarly publications, whereas all the other archives in this slide actually focus on different kinds of data sets, whether at a national or international uh, level. So what makes ADS unique? So I already alluded to some of this. First of all, we focus on scholarly publications. And most, of, most importantly, we um, focus on the literature, uh, so publications that come from the scientific journals, um, but also data sets, high level data sets and software that are found at data archives and software repository. Um, 
we enrich the metadata for all these publications by not just listing um, you know, the basic information such as authors, titles, and abstract, but extracting references, keywords, information such as acknowledgments, um, in, some cases, in some cases, plots and images. And then we connect all of these together in our database. So we maintain a citation database as well as the usage network that again is used for recommendation purposes. Um, we then make efforts to link the papers with the data sets that are discussed in them and with the objects that are measured and described in the papers. So we have links to the different NASA archives as well as object databases such as NED and SIMBED. We also incorporate bibliographies that are uh, provided to us by research institutes and archives. We obviously fix um, ish, any issues with the content that is in our system. And we also maintain an archive of the uh, historical publications that we've digitized. So all the publications prior to basically 1995 are hosted by ADS itself. On the right of, of this slide, I just gave a, I'm giving an overview of all the different kinds of documents or records that we have in our system. This is just um, a breakdown of the frequency of these different document types for the astronomy collection. So as you can see, in astronomy, the majority of records belong to uh, our journal articles, but there's then a lot of other um, types of documents. So journal, preceding articles, e-prints from archive, uh, book chapters, these are typically scientific publications consisting of uh, single papers. And then we have a lot of what we call the gray literature. So there's abstracts um, given at conference proceedings, uh, circulars like the IEU circulars, um, observing and funding proposals, books, um, newsletters, PhD theses, and so on. So we index everything that is relevant um, in, to support research in astronomy, essentially. And we provide multiple ways to search this content. So as you probably know, if you're an astronomer, you can come to ADS and search for papers written by a particular author. And the syntax to do so is the one that I show here, author colon, and then you um, enter the name of the author. We also, of course, allow people to search for uh, papers where a particular person appears as the first author. So we have this shortcut that um, allows you to put a caret in front of the author name to do that. And then there are a bunch of shortcuts, shortcuts that can be used to uh, quickly find the papers of interest. One of my favorite ones is this one where you can enter the last name of the author, in this case, the first author, then followed by the publication year, and then followed by the journal. So this query finds all papers written by uh, William Foreman in 2007 that appear in the Astrophysical Journal. We, of course, also allow for um, what we call unfielded queries, so broad queries that can be um, uh, keywords on a topic, phrases, or author names. Um, in this case, exoplanet atmospheres, and we're allowed to, for, uh, to search the full text. In this case, I'm, I'm searching the full text for these two different terms. Um, many of the features that I just discussed are also available in other search engines, um, like Web of Science or um, other um, databases like Archive and Google Scholar. But there are some unique features of ADS, um, many of which involve um, advanced search capabilities or the ability to find papers that relate to um, particular data sets or um, appear in particular fields. So in the first example, I show how you can, given any keyword, you can find review papers about topics on that keyword. Um, the second one shows how you can find papers that have links to particular data archives. In this case, I say I want data, I want papers that have data um, associated with them from Chandra or XMM, so X ray data, as well as mast data, which is typically uh, optical data. You can also search by institution. For instance, this um, it could be a query that um, someone would create to find papers written at my institution, which is known as the 
Center for Astrophysics or CFA, as well as Harvard University. And um, ADS integrates ORCID in its system. So we both index ORCIDs when they're provided to us in the papers, but we also allow people to claim their own papers uh, associating uh, their ORCID ID with them. And I'll give a demo of that. And finally, we, finally we um, index acknowledgement sections. So acknowledgement sections are very important because that's where people typically mention funding sources. And in this case, I can I show that this query uh, finds all papers that acknowledge NASA funding or that have um, NASA as part of the affiliation of one of the authors. So this is a good way to find all papers that NASA funds either by um, hiring people that do research or funding people that do research. Let me see. Ah, okay, sorry. So. Um, the next thing I wanted to highlight, and uh, hopefully I have time to show this in my demo, is the notifications and recommendations that we've built into the system. Uh, one can build a profile and create a set of queries um, that return content of interest to them. So the queries can, for instance, show all papers written by a certain person, and then week by week you would get a list of new papers that that person created or they could be um, citations to the paper written by a particular person, or they could be um, papers that match a particular keyword, a particular phrase, or that have been written by particular authors. And, and then there's a mechanism to generate a, a notification based on any arbitrary query that I'll show you later. So what you get back are either daily updates from all of these notifications, that's what I'm showing you here, or weekly updates. Um, if you choose to have a weekly update, typically you can have a more, um, a more restricted set of queries that provide a sort of uh, uh, an updated newsletter of what happened in the last week. And, and also we have started introducing recommendations which are made based upon your browsing history. One of the areas in which we, um, one of the functions of ADS is not just providing um, access to all of this information, but also actively promoting what are called the FAIR principles. FAIR uh, stands for uh, findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. And it's a set of principles um, that really espouse the uh, idea of open science, that is making data, software, and publications more easily available and accessible to everyone. So how does ADS help in this regard? First of all, we link to publications in our system. And when we do that, we always provide a hint um, as to whether the publication, the, the full text paper is open access or not. And whether, uh, either way, if there is an archive version, which is a green open access version, we also provide that information in, um, in the metadata of the record. We also, as I mentioned, provide links to data products. In this case, you can see this particular paper has uh, links to eight different archives, um, which include SIMBAD, which is object, uh, you know, object measurements, as well as NED, and then a bunch of other archives that have observations associated with it. We also have links to catalogs um, published with the, uh, um, with the papers when those exist in Vizier. And we have a way to filter and search for object names. In this case, um, I'm showing that you can use our filtering mechanism to focus your searches on particular object names. And finally, we index software records that are um, entered in the Astrophysics Source Code Library, or ASCL, as well as software citations that we extract from the papers and that are cited through a DOI. We also provide support for interdisciplinary re research, certainly in the context of NASA. As you may know, NASA not only funds astrophysics, but they fund other um, related research in planetary science, heliophysics, and also the earth sciences. So um, some of the goals of, um, you know, recent uh, strategic goals for NASA are the search for life in the universe, which 
is a huge research topic and that requires expertise from different disciplines. So you not only need astronomers working on this um, subject, but also planetary scientists who are experts in um, you know, the geology of the planets and in the characteristics of planets. So when you look for exoplanets, you need to have that kind of knowledge. You also need a lot of expertise about geophysics and atmospheric science, because one of the methods in which um, these exoplanets are detected and biosignatures are detected uh, rely on the analysis of spectra from atmospheres. Um, so how is ADS helping in this? Well. Uh, being able to have a central search engine that allows one to search and, and find connections between papers based on citations, topics, and uh, co-readership can help in making those connections. And these connections sort of emerge organically um, simply by maintaining our citation database, by maintaining links to the data archives, and um, you know through these links, connecting the dots and finding information of interest. Um, this uh, visualization is one that was generated using ADS, using the so-called paper network, and shows all the different topics that are found in uh, the cited literature um, uh, appearing in planetary science and astrobiology uh, journals. So if you're interested in exoplanets, you also need to read literature that has to do with uh, the solar system, as you can see, uh, many of the solar planets are represented here and their moons and so on. So what we have been asked to do recently, uh, six months ago, NASA uh, officially asked ADS to um, put effort into expanding our coverage to planetary science and heliophysics in a formal way. We had been indexing some of this content, but now um, we will go much deeper and try to be as um, as thorough uh, for planetary sciences and heliophysics as we have been for astrophysics. So we will not only index journals, but also the great literature, conference proceedings, uh, uh, preprints, and so on. We have already started to also index high-level data products. So the planetary data system, small bod bodies node, um, as issued DOIs for some of the curated data sets and we've ingested them. We have um, mined links to um, uh, planetary archives and earth science archives from the uh, journals of the uh, American Geophysical Union. And we've also started including software packages that are cited in um, articles from the AGU. Okay, so I will start uh, giving a quick demo just to highlight some of the things that I've been uh, mentioning before. So first of all, as you may know, um, we can um, do a search for uh, authors using uh, these keywords. As you can see, I've configured my user profile to by default search um, the two collections that are of most interest to me, astronomy and physics. This is something that you can do by hand by selecting um, the collection uh, filter here, but you can also set up your profile so that by default, you will only search um, what you're interested in. So in my case, I kept physics as well as astronomy, but you could as easily have just gone to astronomy and that removes a lot of, um, uh, you know, extra records that may get in the way when you do any kind of search. The other thing I wanted to show right away is that, you know, whenever we look at a list of papers, you will see here a list of institutions associated with all the affiliations listed in these papers. So I'm here searching for a colleague, uh, Bill Foreman, who actually happens to be my boss. I'm finding his papers. So it's, it's normal that we find a lot of papers written at the Smithsonian Institution, which is our um, you know, parent institution for the Smithsonian Astrophysical Observatory. As you can see, it includes the CFA, which is where we are, as well as Harvard University, because Harvard University is also a parent of the Center for Astrophysics. But this information immediately gives you additional um, useful information, such as 
the other institutions that are found in the list of collaborators. Um, so Max Planck Institute, the Royal Astronomical Society, MIT, et cetera, et cetera. Um, filtering on these lists is, can be very useful when you need to narrow certain searches down to um, a number of institutions, especially when you have a lot of results that you have to make sense of. Um, so other things that you can immediately do is obviously sort this list. So for instance, you can sort it by citation count, and this will give you the most cited papers um, of this person, as well as a total count of citation for this person. Um, you can obviously also go and uh, pull up a full report of the metrics associated with this list of papers. So in this case, I can get a, a full uh, breakdown of the distribution of the papers written by Bill Foreman, as well as all the citations um, through the years that have, um, he has collected with a breakdown of refereed and non-refereed citations. Um, and we have a couple of visualizations here. All of these metrics and, um, oh, this is usage data. So how frequently read his papers are and even his H index and other indices uh, related to his um, performance. All of this data, by the way, is downloadable. If you click on this button, you will get CSV output for all of these data products. So let's close this and let's take a look at some, um, let's just take a look at one of these papers. Um, as you can see, um, as I mentioned, there are, links to data products. In this case, it's a Chandra paper. Um, so there's a link to the Chandra observations mentioned in this paper. We also have a highlight of a plot that appeared in, that, in this paper. And if you click here, you can view a variety of the plots that have been extracted from this um, paper. This preview of um, images from the paper may be useful to give you a sense of what kind of um, content may be associated in the paper. For instance, you may see time series or you may see theoretical models or you know, any other number of plots, um, images of um, surveys. And that may give you a sense of whether you want to actually download the paper and do some, some more um, research on it. Um, other things, of course, that we keep track of are citations and references, similar papers, and so on. One thing that um, I wanted to also highlight is the fact that uh, we have, for some authors, as you can see, we have ORCIDs associated with their names. So in this case, Bill Foreman, um, who is the author that we searched for, we discover that there is an ORCID ID associated with him. And so we can click on this ORCID and ADS then changes the query to be a query based on um, an ORCID. As you know, an ORCID is a unique identifier for all research um, researchers and anybody can get one. And the purpose of ORCID is to provide a unique identifier that is unambiguous. So whether there, may, there could be multiple Bill Formans in the world, they will, there's only one which has this particular ORCID. Um, and so this may be important. I know that um, many people uh, working in Asian countries, especially um, I'm told in, in South Korea, have uh, uh, great problems with uh, name ambiguity. And so my encouragement has always been to use ORCIDs and claim your previous papers using ORCID and then use that as the basis for your um, bibliography. Okay, um, what else? So we have, this is another way to get Bill's papers. Um, all of the ones that have been either tagged with this ORCID by the publisher or that he claimed using uh, the ORCID. One thing that we can uh, immediately uh, do is generate a so-called paper network which is a um, clustering of his papers based on uh, the citation network. And then, um, and then each cluster of papers gets tagged with keywords that are extracted from um, the description of those papers. So 
what does this mean? Well, we have been looking at the list of papers that Bill Foreman wrote, and this clustering tells us what are the research topics that these papers cover um, throughout his career. Um, we actually, okay, we have made a, the network includes 400 papers out of 562, but you can always um, correct that by um, asking to see all of them. And so it will rerun the algorithm and um, bring back a slightly improved um, um, clustering of, it, of all of his papers. And I apologize what the system is a little slow at night because this is when we do most of our updates. Um, so as you can see, we have a number of topics that he worked on. And here in the histogram, we also show a distribution of um, the how the topics have appeared over time. So this is a histogram of the number of papers published in each one of these topic areas over time. So we can get a sense of when Bill was studying, um, you know, outbursts um, uh, in M87, for instance. By clicking here, we also see um, what those papers are. And um, we can also see what connections exist between one uh, cluster of paper and the others. So all of these are connected by the citation uh, network. And here we tell you what papers co-cite papers on these two networks. Um, similarly, we can also view who Bill Foreman has been working with by uh, pulling up the author network. The author network basically shows the different collaborations that Bill has been part of. And once again, the collaborations span um, a certain period of time and um, focus on certain uh, papers for in each case. This might be interesting if you are going to look for um, people who have worked together, um, whether on a topic or with another person, or when whether you're trying to understand whether two people collaborated, for instance, if you're looking for a referee, you don't want to find someone who has, uh, is a close collaborator of a person that you're trying to referee a paper for. Okay, so I think um, I think this is enough for this. Um, I mentioned ORCID. I wanted to show you one more thing to make sure you're aware of this. Um, so I am going to look for my own paper. Um, I am actually fairly, let's say, call myself lucky in the sense that my last name is fairly unique. Um, and I'm, I'm the only person with this last name who has written papers in astronomy. So I don't have a big issue with um, trying to help people find my publications. But um, nonetheless, I use ORCID to disambiguate my name. So what I've done here is under my profile, I've created a uh, connection with the ORCID website. And by turning on the ORCID feature in the ADS interface, I'm now able to see which one of my papers are already recognized in ORCID. Um, and as you can see, these ones, uh, all the ones that have a green bar are papers where I, I or someone else on my behalf has claimed membership, um, authorship in ORCID, but all the other ones are available to me um, for claiming. So by simply clicking the buttons for each one of these papers, I am now sending a claim to the ORCID um, registry saying, I, Alberto Comazzi, claim that this paper has been written by me. And as you do that, you um, also inform ADS that this is one of your papers. So what happens is overnight, we process these claims and then assign them to your ORCID once you've done this. Um, and once you do that, again, the, the advantage is that you can simply use your ORCID uh, as a way to search for all your papers, and you can give that search to your colleagues or use it to generate your CV, for instance. Another feature, okay, so let's turn this off. Um, another feature that is quite useful is um, the one associated with um, libraries. Um, 
what we could do. Sorry, let me find the menu here. What users are allowed to do is, is create collections of papers for any number of purposes. So this is my own collection of papers. As you can see, I have a couple, three actually different libraries that um, I use for keeping a list of ADS papers. I don't always, I'm not always up to date, but here I have two different lists um, where I keep lists of refereed and non-refereed papers. And then I have a list um, of all ADS papers. I think that's what it is, or only ADS related papers. As you can see, um, this list uh, is one uh, yeah, where I just keep adding papers that seem to talk about ADS before I move them to some other place. And um, in this case, the, um, the library is public, which means that can be shared with the rest of the world. The default is that all these libraries are private, so they're only viewable, visible and accessible uh, to yourself. Not only that, but you can invite collaborators to either view or edit the contents of the library. In this case, I have two collaborators within my team. So any of us can add papers to this library. And this can be a very useful way to um, share reading lists with your colleagues or if you're writing a paper with someone else and you are creating a list of references, the bibliography for the paper, you can have multiple people add um, the papers to this list and then um, use it when you're, you've completed um, the bibliography. And of course, anything, any paper that you search can be easily added um, to any of these libraries. So just to clarify this paper i think we haven't i haven't put it in my uh, oops library yet um so i can go here select um uh, uh let's just put it in the ads library and add the paper to it and one new record was added to the ads library okay so um that's all good now, what do you do when you need to research a new topic? Um, well, ADS provides multiple ways to do that, but you know the, the simplest way is to simply type the keywords related to the subject of interest. Um, so um, we were talking about the search for life in exoplanet atmospheres, so we can just run a search um, in quotes for exoplanet atmospheres. Using the double quotes means that this is um, what we call the phrase search. So we're looking for the, both of those two words appearing next to each other, not just anywhere in an abstract or a paper. And excuse me, if we perform this kind of search, then we are looking for these two words in what's called the metadata of the article. So we're looking for, um, the appearance of exoplanet atmospheres and all of its um, variations in the title, the abstract, potentially the author field. It won't be found in this case. Um, so we're searching the basic basic metadata, and um, as you can see, we can we find both plural and singular atmosphere and atmospheres, um, and. Um, so ADS understands synonyms and um, acronyms, so you don't have to worry about that. But what you may not be aware of is that we, um, if you, you can also search the full text. I mentioned that we index the full text. So the first query returned just above 3,000 papers. But if I do a full text search, I'm not only searching the abstracts and titles, but I'm searching the actual contents of all these papers. And as you can see, the number of results is almost twice as much. Um, and you know, the as you can see, this is a topic that is a very hot one. So the growth of papers is uh, increasing very highly. And of course, you can show highlights and also verify that all these the context in which all of these. Um, search terms appear. So this is very useful before you decide whether you want to find out more about particular papers. Um, 
what else? Well, having a list of results also um, provides a way for us to identify those authors that are the most prolific. So the people who wrote these papers are the ones that appear in this author's um, uh, menu on the left. So we can see, for instance, that Jonathan Fortney is the most prolific one. He wrote 301 papers that have something to do, or at least mention exoplanet atmospheres, Sarah Seeger is next, and so on. Um, one, one feature that, um, that we have, our system has, and that you cannot find anywhere else, is the capability for any uh, list of results to be used um, using a second order operator. And um, there's a whole blog post and article and help pages that discuss that. But I, I'm just gonna show it by example. If I go under the explore menu, as you can see, we have uh, operations that can be done on this list of results. One of the operations is reviews. And the meaning of this, I'm just going to do it, and then I'll, I'll explain what is happening here. What I am um, creating here is I'm using the, the original query, and then I apply the reviews operator. And what that does is it looks for papers that review the topic of interest. The way it works is um, first we run this query for exoplanet atmospheres and find all of those 6,000 papers. And then we look at the, using the citation graph, the citation information in our database, we look at which papers cite a lot of those exoplanet atmospheres um, articles. And, and the logic behind this is that um, review papers have uh, a large number of citations for um, the papers that are relevant on any particular topic. So what that means is that you can start from any query on any topic that you like, and then you can explore the reviews or trending articles using any of these operators. Um, instead of having a human person classify articles by their, um, you know, one by one, they're saying, yes, this is a review article and this is not. So in fact, what you get back is not always the traditional um, review article. In this case, the, the most relevant one is actually a handbook, the Exoplanet Handbook. And um, why is it there? Well, as a handbook, it has a lot of citations to uh, papers related to exoplanet atmosphere. So that's why it appears at the top of this list. Okay, and, and so on. Um, so, and then there are actually annual reviews articles. As you can see, all the other ones are quite relevant. Um, and similarly, we could have done, um, we could have done uh, other things um, such as uh, looking for trending papers that this uses the co-readership uh, network. So these are papers that um, are highly read and connected to the papers on exoplanet atmospheres um, through uh, user clicks. So we use the anonymous usage information to be able to rank papers and provide the second order operations. And in general, what I'm, what I'm trying to convey here is that I invite you all to explore all of these um, function, the explore functionality, because it's, it's sort of hidden, away, but it's a very powerful way to gain insight into any of, of um, any of the topics that you might be interested in. And of course, the, the explore um, menu for author networks is also very uh, relevant in this case, because um, if, again, if you're searching for experts on any particular topic or, um, or referees for um, reviewing a proposal or an article, you can use this information to find uh, experts on a topic and then see who those people have worked with. So Jonathan Fortney, Fortney has worked with a lot of the people in this, um, in this diagram and I would not wanna pick him if, um, if uh, I had to, uh, or any of his collaborators, if I had to review one of his proposals. 
Uh, so again, this provides um, insights in ways that are difficult to discern when you start just from a long list of papers. Okay, I want to show you one more thing before um, we go back. Um, let's go back to our search for exoplanet atmospheres. Um, let's see. Uh, sorry. Um, what I wanted to show you is the ability, as I mentioned, to create notifications. And this is quite simple. You can either go into the user settings and start from scratch, or uh, my favorite way is to, when you find a topic of interest, if you want to be notified about new papers that um, appear in this list, you can simply click here and say, create a, an email notification. You can decide whether you want to get a daily or weekly notification. Let's do weekly for now. And then we just give it a name. Uh, so, uh, so I'm giving it a name and I click on create. Okay, the notification is created. And now I'm gonna go to my notification settings and show you that it's right here. It appeared as the, um, as the most recent notifications. But as you can see, I've already created a bunch of them uh, prior to this. Um, and the way you do it is quite simple. You click on create, and then you pick the kind of, we have some pre-canned way to um, generate these notifications. Um, the archive notifications are daily notifications typically are used to filter content that is published in archive. So you only get content that matches some of your keywords. Um, you can, have citations, uh, notifications. So when somebody cites you or one of your collaborator, you can see new papers by a particular author or collaborators, things based on keyword or the general notification, which is the one I just created, um, which is simply um, using your current query to generate a notification. And so once you create a notification, first of all, you, you will get an email with um, either daily or weekly with those contents. But you can also sort of have uh, an idea of a preview if, if you're interested in. Um, this is what happens under the hood. Uh, ADS is taking your original query, exoplanet atmospheres, and then it applies a filter that says, I want only publications um, from the last week. So this is six days or seven days worth of, um, of papers. And I'm doing that by um, you know, it, it's doing it for me by specifying the entry date of these new records in our system. So if I had created this weekly notification, I would have gotten six papers in my um, email for the week. Okay, so I think that's enough for the demo. I would like to add a couple of things before I conclude. Um, so everything that we do is certainly reflected in our website and the demo that I just gave you gives some highlights of things that are available to you. It's by no means exhaustive. But one important thing that I wanted to also mention is that everything that you can do through the website, you can also export and access through our API. So first of all, through the website, as you probably know, you can export uh, records to be included in your manuscript. So in this case, I'm exporting a BibTeX record so I can cite this paper um, and without having to worry about formatting or doing it by hand. All the visualizations and um, uh, the statistics can be exported as CSV files. Um, and to do that, you just click on this download button and you get back the data um, without having to know, you know anything about programming. You just download the data that you're viewing in your browser. If you are into programming, then um, we have a rich API, which is open. All you have to do is, is register and get a token. And we have extensive documentation um, that I illustrate here. Uh, we also have a, um, a blog entry that we recently created that explains how all of this works. 
And um, there's also a Python package, uh, which is pip installable. Uh, pip install ADS will get you a package, a community contributed package that makes uh, all of this access much easier. We also have created some sample notebooks. Um, so these are Python notebooks that um, you can just fire up and you know all you have to do is enter one variable, which is your uh, developer token, and then you can easily query the API. And yeah, and that's it. So um, more information, um, I'm happy to share the slides. I have some pointers here. Everything that you see here is available through our homepage. Um, you maybe need to dig a little bit. And I will um, stop at this point. Uh, thank you. Uh, wishing you a happy new year and answer any of your questions.